always near the front line, the Harrier is the embodiment of close air support. Combining the speed of a jet with the control of a chopper, it is ready to fight in any theater. But in the Persian Gulf, its role as protector will be tested as never before. Persian Gulf War, the Allied air assault of Iraq enters its third week. Saddam Hussein, his army and his people are subjected to a seemingly endless bombing campaign. Time has come to draw blood, American blood. The Iraqis attack in three places. One is El Kafchi, a border town in Saudi Arabia. The Battle of Kafchi uh, turned out to be a very interesting situation. There are a couple of theories. One is that Kafchi was a main attack. In other words, a major effort by Saddam Hussein to attack into Saudi Arabia and to disrupt the buildup of American forces. Uh, the second is that it was some kind of probing attack for less important reasons than the commitment of troops to a main attack. I think over time I've come to believe that it probably was a major attack on his part. The Iraqis move into the town so quickly that a two-man U.S. Marine observation team is trapped and must crawl under rooftops to hide from the enemy. They weren't in the vehicle. Uh, vehicles, the tires were spinning, deuce gear was in there, but they weren't in the vehicle. We don't know if they fled or were captured. It's got to be disappointing not to be able to find those men. <sighs> yeah, it's, uh, we wanted to get them pretty bad. The Marines call for air support. For three days, the Allied Air Command pounds the Iraqis with B-52 bombers and Air Force A-10s. There is another plane in this fight, the Harrier. And when the Marines need close air support, or CAS, they want a U.S. Marine in the cockpit. During the war, there were more than 3,300 sorties by the AV-8B Marine Corps attack jet, an average of two a day for the 86 airplanes in theater. The airstrikes around al kafji devastate the Iraqi tanks and artillery. For two days, there is heavy and close street fighting between the Iraqis and Allied forces to take back the town and free the trapped Marines. The great benefit for the Marines in the Harrier is that it's on station now. It is close to the battle line, minutes away instead of hours away. It's able to be there when you need it. And that's the Marine philosophy, is get the grunts on the front lines now. And those guys in the cockpits are grunts. You know, they're, they understand the mentality of being close and being available. Throughout the war, the Harriers are based in two locations. One, a soccer stadium in Saudi Arabia, hastily converted to accommodate the Harriers and support troops. The Harriers are based so close to the fighting 
that they never require aerial refueling. Astro Center, Stone 1-2, established Angel 7. Harriers are also aboard ships sailing in the Persian Gulf. The primary reason the Marines purchased the Harrier is its flexibility. We're at about one, one and a half degrees of pitch and a little cold, so moving just a little bit, not too bad. This high-performance single-engine jet is capable of V-stall, vertical or short takeoff and landing. For landings, there is no need for an arresting cable. The jet can take off from a ship without a catapult. And you don't need an 8,000-foot runway, an easy target for an enemy to attack. It is the jet that dazzles the airshow crowd. It is the jet famous for its ability to hover. The Harrier has a reputation for being a dangerous airplane to fly because it's difficult to fly. It's like balancing 20 tons on the point of a needle. Particularly the early Harriers in the Marines, the AV-8A, was a difficult airplane to fly, and when they put new pilots in it, what they called nuggets, the loss rate was high. The early Harrier, designed and built in Britain, is indeed a difficult plane to fly, especially in a hover. But that ability to hover is the reason both the British and the US Marines were interested in the plane. Because of the vertical capability the plane has greater access than conventional jets and is able to operate in confined areas. Marine Corps' mission remains what it has been for the last several decades, and that is to be the nation's force in readiness. We're the 911 force. Uh, when you call, we have the capability to respond anywhere around the world, and that's the way we tailor ourselves, and that's what we train for. Today's area pilots train with a Marine Expeditionary Unit, an armada with troops, tanks, and artillery. They sail for six months at a time into the world's hotspots. The mission is simple, be close, and be ready to go ashore and fight. Quantico, Virginia. All Marine officers have to pass this way. They spend six months here at the basic school learning the life of the rifleman, learning the life of the grunt. One Zulu, this is one Papa. Anchorage, over. Among the ranks of these second lieutenants are future aviators. Roger out. In battle, they will be called upon to fight for the life of the men on the ground. Though this may be as far from a cockpit as any human could be, it proves that first and foremost, they are Marines. These lieutenants are cold, wet, and hungry. In the rain and in the mud, more tired than they have ever been, they must prepare for an attack. 
They must dig in. Okay, we're gonna build that parapet up in front of his aiming stake so that something can't penetrate through here and get to him. And that's what we want with all the holes. This soft earth, sir, will be able to stop around? No, it's gonna take three, about three feet of packed earth to stop around. Okay. So you're gonna have to take and occasionally pack this stuff okay. down okay. all the way back in order to get it to stop around. Okay. Marine aviators first have to become qualified ground combat commanders and have to prove themselves to be capable in doing that. So they go through the basic school like every other grunt. None of the other services do that. Hadn't showered since Sunday, Sunday night. <laughs> They're out there in the uh, you know freezing rain and mud and there's a relationship that develops between the guys on the ground and the guys on the air that's based on a couple of things. One is the guys on the ground know that the marine aviator up there in the air knows exactly what he's going through, the conditions in which he's working, and what he's trying to accomplish. And the guy on the ground knows that the guy up in the air knows what additional kinds of things need to be done to get the mission accomplished. So those two are in real close sync. The second thing is that because the Marine Corps is a small organization, there are maybe 8,000 captains in the Marine Corps, for example, so that the captain on the ground, when the Marine aircraft arrive overhead and somebody comes up on the net, he knows that guy. He went to basic with him. He slept out in the mud with this guy. The United States Marine Corps is the only fighting force in the world to integrate air and ground forces to such an extent. The Marines have their own fixed-wing force, seven squadrons of Harriers among them. If you go back far enough, uh, the Marine Corps was faced with a dilemma, and this was kind of after Korea. We had learned that air power was a very useful tool for ground forces being able to maneuver and bring firepower to bear where they wanted it. And the most probable use of the United States Marine Corps was going to be third world countries or places we had never even heard of. And that means that it's very hard to get there. And one of the things that happened is the ground forces shed some of their artillery and said, that's hard for me to get to, to various places. It's also hard for me to haul around with me. But if aviation could provide the firepower that the artillery used to, then I'm free to maneuver in a lot more free fashion. We took that up and we said, we'll do that. There are close to 400 Harrier pilots in the Marine Corps. Pilots are chosen because of their high marks throughout two and a half years of training in both classroom and cockpit. The AV-8B is an unforgiving airplane, and so too the guidelines that determine who will fly it. Score below a certain mark, and you fail to qualify for the Harrier community. The Marine Corps instituted this policy to minimize the risk for disaster. Detachments of Harrier squadrons are deployed at various places around the world. That's all there is to it. The Marines are the only armed force in the United States to fly the AV-8B. Italy and Spain have added the Harrier to their arsenals. In Britain, the birthplace of this single-engine jet, both the Royal Navy and the Royal Air Force continue to fly the Harrier. The heart of the plane, and what makes it unique, is the center-borne engine which is capable of 23,000 pounds of thrust. The AV-8 is powered by the Rolls-Royce F402RR408 engine, affectionately known as the Pegasus engine. The intake is a very large intake to take in a large volume of air, especially during the vertical and short takeoff evolutions of the aircraft. To augment the large intake, we have auxiliary air doors, which are open during slow speed flight and hovering flight. 
and they go around the circumference around the intake. For high speed flight, uh, the fan obviously has to bend a lot of air around to get to the engine face. We have what's known as boundary layer doors. They pull off the boundary layer door and allow a smooth flow of air to the face of the fan. Now we'll go back to the back of the aircraft here. You'll see what makes this aircraft special is that the vertical short takeoff capability that this aircraft has. We have four nozzles, two on each side. Towards the back is the hot nozzle. The temperatures of the hot air come out as hot as 800 degrees Celsius. This does create some bit of a problem if we have to land on asphalt. Up front is the ducted fan air. The nozzles would rotate down and that allows the aircraft to hover and uh, vertical takeoff, vertical landing. They all work together and they're all worked through in one lever in a cockpit, selectable, is just adjacent to the throttle. Pilot selectable and they're not computer controlled. He basically controls the nozzles, puts them where he wants them, when he wants them. That's one of the other things that makes this airplane a pilot's airplane. Airplane's a machine. Yeah. Okay, we got you to sight from Leeds, northern AGV west, about 10. Roger, visual on the target. Yeah, I like that one better. World War II, the battle for the Pacific. Time after time, U.S. Marines execute the mission for which they train. The amphibious assault. They wade ashore and fight at places like Tarawa. Saipan, Iwo Jima. It is the same at Incheon, Korea. The Marines are an invading force. When they go beyond the reach of their own artillery, they need firepower. That is the mission of Marine Air. Thus, the mission of the Harrier. It is an airborne artillery battery. But that was not the mission the designers had in mind. The airplane was originally developed as a nuclear strike airplane. It was not designed as a close air support airplane. The airplane was designed to carry a single nuclear weapon in a tactical environment where all the airfields had been bombed and you had no place to fly airplanes, but you could fly them off roads, out of forest glens, and other places. Well, that mission never happened. So we had to turn them into close air support airplanes, fighter bombers. The Marine Corps bought the Harrier from the British in the early 1970s, and the first squadrons were formed. Because the jet has a reputation of being tough to fly, many of their best pilots rotate into the newly designated AV-8A. We handpicked the first people that went into it. The thought was, well, let's try it, let's test it, let's get three squadrons worth, and that will give us enough to check out the operational characteristics, because if we could make this work, it did exactly what we wanted. At the end of three years and no accidents, the system came back and said, you guys must have been wrong. It can't be hard to fly. Look, this is wonderful. And so instead of gradually introducing different people to it, they just opened up the floodgates. And within the next six weeks, we had uh, crashed three airplanes and killed two people. It has a reputation. I know my wife was very concerned when I first got into the Harry community. Uh, it was known as the widow maker. And, uh, and it has killed a lot of people. It's an airplane like any other that uh, it doesn't tolerate mistakes. And they found really they needed a pilot with a lot of jet time, a lot of high performance, high speed time, so that his brain was up and moving all the time. And they finally made an, uh, an issue out of it, not assigning nuggets to Harrier squadrons, and the loss rate went down.
This is the lineal descendant of the AV-8A, the McDonnell Douglas AV-8B. Like its predecessor, the newer model has four movable nozzles on the fuselage, which are used to vector or direct the thrust created by the Rolls-Royce engine. The cockpit was raised and the bubble canopy gives the pilot greater visual range. A computer-assisted reaction control system was added to the plane to help keep the pilot out of trouble. When they redesigned the Harrier from the AV-8A to the AV-8B, a lot of the dangerous characteristics disappeared. They did engineer a great deal of user-friendliness into the airplane. It's an easier airplane to fly. It's slower. Uh, pilots don't like losing the 80 to 100 knots that they've lost. Uh, they would rather go faster, uh, but it can carry more, more weapons, and it, it is uh, certainly not the, the puckering airplane it was before. Now, the way the Harrier works is the rash control system essentially balances the thrust vector, which is right through the center of the aircraft. Now, if you think about it, it's all this thrust, it's kind of like balancing on the head of a needle. Well, the way we balance that is we have reaction control air coming out of the wingtip left side, right side, the nose, and the tail. Those are all interconnected and controlled by the stick and the rudders. For instance, if an aircraft wanted, pilot wanted to roll the aircraft to the left, he'd move the stick to the left. What would happen is air would come out of the bottom of the right wing, starting a rolling moment. Same thing holds true with the nose of the airplane. He wants to raise the nose, pulls back with the stick, which is natural for a pilot, then the puffer duct in front of the airplane opens up, air blows down, and the nose is then picked up. Good morning, Astro Center, Snow 1 2, single AV 8. Currently an Angel 17, negative sweet lock. 7 through 8 copies, and I may need to ask you for a higher marshal uh, to stay out of the clouds. Enjoy, Roger. August 1990. Marines and their Harriers will face the ultimate test of their plane and their training as they fly off to war for the first time. Harrier squadrons and their pilots, along with 90,000 fellow Marines, join the fight for Kuwait. Carrier pilots in the Gulf are told they won't play a role until the ground war begins. They're going to be held in reserve. How are we doing? <laughs> Two things are going to happen today. I don't know which one. Marine Corps Commanding General Boomer doesn't want to lose Harriers before his grunts need them. Let me give you the proposals that are before Saddam Hussein so you understand what his choices are. All throughout the planning, I had one major overriding fear, and that was that we would get caught or held up while breaching minefields. And while we were slowed down by these minefields, the Iraqis would use chemical weapons against us. And those chemical weapons would be fired by Iraqi artillery pieces. So my main concern was to get rid of the artillery because my nightmare, so to speak, was being caught there and subjected to chemical weapons. So whenever I talked to our pilots, I tried to stress to them, look, taking out tanks may be a little more fun and it may be sexy, but get the artillery. We'll deal with the tanks. We can handle the tanks. What we are less prepared to deal with are chemical weapons, and they're going to be delivered by artillery, so you get the artillery. And they did just that. The first day of the air war, the day Allied planes fill the sky over Iraq, Harriers begin their work. And on behalf of the Grunts, they go after the Iraqis with a vengeance. 
Now, a grunt is not afraid to go through a breach or a barricade. They can take on infantry, tanks, minefields, chemicals. They were not afraid of that. Hey, George, what's up? What they're worried about is when you breach an obstacle, you can go through it, but what it does is it channelizes you. You start putting hundreds or thousands of people through very narrow corridors that they've blown through this barricade. Well, once you've now gotten those uh, people into a small area, that's when the artillery rains down on you, because now they've got you in a small area. And that's what scares the grunts, and that's what they are worried about. Now, unless you're attacking, moving your artillery in front of you, which is may not be tactically sound, um, you're going to be moving away from your artillery coverage and into their, the heart of their artillery envelope. That's where the air comes in. We can destroy all the rocket launchers, artillery pieces, self-propelled artillery. So that was our mission. We're going to make a little t-shirt. It's called Artie Busters. As troops prepare to attack, Harrier pilots join a series of raids on Iraqi artillery batteries near the Kuwait border. The Harriers launch and loiter in what the Marines call a wolf pack. Marine Corps EA-6 prowlers with their electronics jam Iraqi ground radar. Marine artillery sneaks up to the Kuwait border, undetected because of the jamming by the EA-6s. The artillery opens fire and attacks Iraqi artillery positions. The jamming halts long enough for the Iraqis to locate the now withdrawing U.S. artillery. The Iraqis attack, firing their guns. And those muzzle flashes are seen by a Marine pilot in his F-A-18D, who directs the Harriers onto the enemy guns. Okay, I see a long, I see where Lee Cliffs were, and I'm following kind of a dark road to the west, inland. Roger. About uh, five miles from the target. The goal of the mission is not just to destroy enemy artillery, but is morale as well. To let the Iraqi soldier know that every time he fires his artillery, an Allied airplane will attack within seconds. While the Harrier is capable of dropping TV and laser-guided or smart bombs, in the Gulf, the cluster bomb, or CBU, is the weapon favored by the Marine Corps. They drop more of these than all services combined. To accomplish the mission, the Harriers fly low, and low is vulnerable. The Harrier has one engine. Knock it out, and most likely, the plane is lost. A heat-seeking, or IR missile, will home in on the Harrier near the center of the fuselage, near the rear nozzles, or hot nozzles. An area of the plane which can reach temperatures as high as 1,400 degrees Fahrenheit. We learned a few things out of it. We used to think that if you went 450 knots or above, you didn't have to worry about getting hit by an IR shoulder-mounted weapon. That's no longer true. Harrier pilots are hit hard in the Gulf by the heat-seeking missiles of the Iraqi forces. One is Captain Craig Berriman. I felt just a, a big thump on the side of the airplane and heard this huge explosion and the airplane went end over end. As I started seeing the ground rushing up toward me and I'm thinking I'm gonna have to, to make a decision here pretty quick as to whether I'm gonna punch out of the airplane or whether I'm gonna just stay with it. Now, uh, the reason I had to make that decision is because our intel guys had given us some, some pretty graphic briefings as to what the Iraqis were doing to some of the Kuwaiti resistance folks and, and it was not pretty. I didn't, I didn't want that to happen to me. So um, I thought, well, maybe I'll just ride this airplane in. And the more I thought about it as I'm coming down in the, uh, the airplane, I said, well, that's kind of a stupid idea. Berryman ejects 
and watches his plane hit the deck and slam onto an Iraqi trench line. There was a sand dune probably half a mile or so inland from me, and I figure if I can get over to that sand dune, uh, it'll give me a chance to uh, pull out my uh, survival radio, pull out my pistol, and, and come up with some sort of a uh, evasion plan. As I uh, start to uh, run, I start seeing the sand flipping up around me as the Iraqis start shooting at me again. And, and I keep running. I finally get to the uh, sand dune, and just on the other side of the sand dune was an Iraqi armored personnel carrier rolling up that I hadn't seen, and I basically ran myself into another unit. In an instant, Berryman, the U.S. Marine Harrier pilot, becomes a trophy for the Iraqis, a prisoner of war. When you land and you find out, hey, one of the Harriers didn't come home, um, it kind of hits in that, hey, those sparkles you're seeing on the ground are actually shooting at us and they're trying to kill us. And then you find that, yes, they did get somebody. You take a moment to reflect on your comrade, but then you look at what you're doing. Are our tactics sound? Um, are we doing are uh, delivering our weapons properly? Are we doing our job right? And you kind of look over those and you always learn from whether it's a mistake or a combat loss, whatever it may be. And once you do that, then you just press on. It, it, was, it, was, uh, it was very sad to hear about Craig. We didn't know if he was alive or not. Berryman is taken to Baghdad, where other captured American pilots are held. As I'm uh, sitting in this dark, damp, smelly uh, cell, I can hear the Iraqis beating on a prisoner next to me. And that's probably the worst feeling I could ever imagine, just listening to somebody else being beaten. Uh, because you know that there's nothing that you can do to help them out. And, and probably the next worst thing is knowing that uh, sooner or later, your turn is going to come, and they're going to come in and beat you. Well, they came into my cell, there was these two guys. Uh, one stood at the doorway holding a candle, and this other guy came over to me. And, and I was up in the, uh, the corner of this uh, little cell trying to protect my leg as best I could because I thought it was broken. And the first thing he did was he comes over, and he grabs me, pulls me out of the corner, and kicks me in the broken leg. And, and it was extremely painful. And then he just starts punching on me. And I'm still blindfolded, and I'm still handcuffed, but I can kind of see uh, underneath the, the, the uh, blindfold. And he is hitting me so hard that, uh, that I am actually seeing stars. And I always thought that, uh, you know, when you see the cartoon characters, when they get hit really hard, you see the, uh, the stars going around their head. I always thought that was just a, a, a comical thing. But uh, I was actually seeing stars. He was hitting me so hard. Berryman's target, the day he was shot down, had been an Iraqi convoy headed toward the town of al Kafchi the scene of the first major battle between the Allies and the Iraqis. It was a battle that revealed much about the Iraqi army and the Iraqi soldier. It taught us that the Iraqis were the gang that couldn't shoot straight. They couldn't hit the broad side of a barn. We learned they couldn't, to use American vernacular, uh, shoot, move, and communicate at the same time, and you need to be able to do those things in order to conduct a successful attack. Perhaps the most important was that we learned if you bloodied their nose in round one, they did not want to come back for round two. That they just didn't have the fire in the belly for this fight. The Iraqi troops do not have the fire in their bellies. They surrender in droves. However, Saddam is not simply going to walk out of Kuwait. The Allied invasion spans the Saudi border with Kuwait. The U.S. Marine Corps battle plan calls for a two-pronged attack to engage the enemy head on. The United States Army will sweep in from the left behind the Iraqis and destroy the Republican Guard. But when the ground war is finally launched, the Marines move so swiftly that they serve as a piston, forcing the Iraqis north. The day that the ground war kicked off, I flew uh, four missions throughout that day, the first day. And it was pretty interesting because uh, initially early on, um, as we'd be flying up over the border, you could look down and you could see just lines of logistics and tanks and Marines getting ready to go through all the breaches. And by the time I came up for my second sortie, it looked like 
rat patrol hauling butt across the desert there. In a bid to blunt the Allied assault, the Iraqis torch the oil wells of Kuwait. But the winds shift and the choking black smoke is blown into the faces of the Iraqis instead. The oil fires also make life difficult for the pilots. smoke and the haze from all the oil fires. We had to get down below it. We're a visual bombing aircraft, so uh, we really had no means to bomb otherwise without uh, just simply dropping on a, on a coordinate, and that's not very accurate. So we pressed down through the clouds, through the smoke, and uh, once you're underneath, you're very vulnerable. It's pretty easy for a guy on the ground to pick up an aircraft that's silhouetted against a, a cloud cover. So that was a little bit uh, uncomfortable feeling. Flying under the clouds becomes more than an uncomfortable feeling for Captain Scott Walsh. First thing I noticed was this uh, huge explosion, the plane jerk, and uh, I looked down and all my lights had lit up red. It looked like a Christmas tree in the cockpit. And getting the red lights is not good, especially the big one that says fire. And I looked over my shoulder and uh, it looked like a Roman candle coming out the wing. A nearby Marine in his F-A-18 flies in close to help Walsh. There's not much you can do for a guy when he's on fire alone in a plane, but just having them coming up beside me and talking to me really uh, gave me a lot of peace of mind and so on. And uh, I thought about ejecting initially, but I remember my father had always told me, uh, fuel burns and vapor explodes. Captain Walsh flies for 10 minutes on fire. I was trying to find a road. I thought, hey, I can land this plane anyway. I fly a Harrier. So I talked to the F-18. I said, hey, how about this field in the central Kuwait that we had overrun? He said, yeah, I'll lead you over there. And I rolled in, tried to get my gear down, but uh, it wouldn't come down. I tried the emergency system to blow them down. Uh, that didn't work. Uh, so I thought, well, I can do a vertical landing then. I tried to pull the nozzle lever in to get the nozzles to point down and get my thrust below me. But I think uh, the missile had destroyed the right rear hot nozzle. So the three nozzles went down, one didn't. Uh, gets the aircraft kind of squirrely in the air at that point. So it wasn't, I couldn't control it. And the general rule in the Harrier is if you move the nozzle lever and the plane does something funny, put it back where it was before. So I started thinking, you know, I may have to eject out of this aircraft. And you don't really want to ever do that because the plane's flying at this point. Right about the time we were talking about this, the uh, hydraulics bled out completely. The stick froze up, and it, uh, the nose pitched up and rolled uncontrollably. And the Hornet started yelling at me, hey, eject, eject, eject. Uh, so I said, hey, I I'm getting out now. And I said, so Walsh briefed his squadron on what happened uh, next. And then the freaking parachute came out. And that was about the most wild thing was the opening shot. Because you go from like 200 to zero in about a second. And next thing I know, I'm seeing my Hey, I couldn't touch my toes right now, but I was touching them then because my hands and toes and head all went forward. And uh, I saw just stars everywhere. It, it twisted, so the rises were shoving my head down. And as I was unraveling, I saw the plane hit up there, so big orange fireball. That, well, that must be the plane, and went back around, and there's the field, and spun back around again. There's still the plane. <laughs> and uh, then it kind of stopped, and uh, I thought about the procedures they tell us, you know, check hand field. You know, I kind of sat there and thought, God, I hope it's good. Yeah, I looked up, and there it was. I was like, Yes, you know, good <laughs> canopy. So I kind of lifted my knees up, and, uh, and as I hit, I pulled on the rise and tried to twist. Basically hit toes, knees, hips, shoulder, rolled on my back, thing dragged me a little bit, popped the risers, and uh, hopped up. And uh, Major Peters, in the fact, they, they, they thought I landed on my feet. They said, it looked like you landed on your feet, because as soon as it hit, you were running away. <laughs> and I said, no, I got hit next to Walsh dragged, I mean, is rescued by Marines. Berriman is not so lucky. The bombing of buildings in the enemy capital city by the Allied Air Forces almost kills him. The building in Baghdad where Berriman and 12 other American prisoners are being held makes it onto the target list of the Allied Air Command. Berriman is awakened one night by two thunderous explosions, followed by a deafening silence. At about that time, somebody yells, incoming, and you start hearing this click, 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 click. And what that was, was that was the 
fins to that laser-guided bomb as it was making its correction down that laser beam toward the target. That next bomb was supposed to come in center of the building, which where, where we all were. It was supposed to destroy the entire building. Fortunately, it went right over the top of the building, landed out in the uh, parking lot. It exploded out in the parking lot, and this huge fireball came into the, uh, the window where it had been and just went in the room and then sucked itself right back out. Just the most incredible thing I'd ever seen. I prayed and almost continually that, the, that God would give me the strength to, uh, to see this thing through. And, and fortunately, he did. But the other thing that I kind of drew strength from was every night, the Allies would come in and they would bomb Baghdad. And I, I knew that as long as they were bombing Baghdad, they were doing something to try to end this war and to try to get us out of there. Three days after the ground war begins, the Marines control Kuwait City. In one of the war's more memorable photo ops, it is the Egyptians who liberate the city. But it is the Marines who lead the way. Kuwait is liberated. Iraq's army is defeated. Our military objectives are met. Tonight, the Kuwaiti flag once again flies above the capital of a free and sovereign nation. And the American flag flies above our embassy. And soon, we will open wide our arms to welcome back home to America our magnificent fighting forces. The USS Mercy hospital ship. American prisoners of war embrace freedom. They are on their way home. Of the thousands of sorties flown by Harrier pilots, a total of five planes were lost. Two pilots were killed, one was rescued by Marines, and two were captured. It is not until the prisoners are released that the Marine Corps learns that Captain Craig Berriman is alive. My wingman, all he had seen was my airplane get hit, and he had seen the airplane explode and hit the ground, hadn't seen a parachute. So he went back and he told uh, my squadron that, that, that he hadn't thought that I had gotten out of the airplane. And that same word got back to my family and my wife that, that I hadn't probably gotten out of the airplane. So for 37 days, they were being told uh, that, that I probably wasn't going to be coming home. And it was probably hardest on my wife of all, just not knowing whether I was dead or alive. Captain Harry M. Roberts, United States Air Force. Captain Russell Sanborn, United States Marine Corps. Captain Michael C. Berryman, United States Marine Corps. When the word came down that, hey, Raz is alive, he's a POW, and he's been held. And we knew he probably didn't get the greatest treatment, but he was alive, and we were getting him back. And that was a, that was a wonderful moment. Despite their harrowing experience, even downed Harrier pilots swear by their plane. Loyalists say the plane is unique, ahead of its time, and plagued by an undeserved reputation. To others, it's a widow maker, a difficult, even dangerous airplane to fly. Don't tell that to the Marines. Ground commanders of the Marine Corps during the Gulf War praised the Harrier. Throughout the war, Harrier pilots flew the close air support mission. They were there to support the grunts. They are, after all, Marines. Marine pilots are famed for having very, very big egos. And they'll get into a bar discussion with grunts and they'll talk about how the grunts are four mile an hour men and how they're not smart enough to come in out of the rain. And all this kind of easy banter goes back and forth. But when it comes down to doing an operation, the guys on the ground depend on the guys in the air, the guys in the air depend on the guys on the ground. And there's this mystical identification between the two. Marine pilots wear helmet covers that are camouflage. Now, they wear helmet covers so their helmets don't scratch the canopy, but why do they wear camouflage? Once it's a badge of pride and identification with the guys on the ground. 